good uh, to see how uh, uh, to get it. And all the programs which we start now should be uh, uh, at least uh, focused on investment uh, because investment, I think it's a, it's a real uh, issue because at least we have to earn the money back which we are spending now in a very generous way. And uh, therefore it's also not good to have all these national borders. Uh, I think Italy started with a good policy to look where are the areas where people are really affected uh, and uh, tracking and see how to, to keep this as small as possible. Uh, but we all know that uh, the virus doesn't accept uh, geographical or political borders. Uh, we have to look how we can it make as much difficult as possible for the virus uh, that uh, the virus uh, can't spread. And uh, then, of course, we would need all the diagnostic to, to find the virus, uh, to see which methods are there that we can detect the virus. Uh, so I think it's also a, a question of innovation, which kind of different activities we can start uh, to see how to see uh, how the virus moves around the world if it comes back. Uh, and at the end, we have to start a new program uh, for SMEs and for our economic uh, development, uh, because if we get too much unemployment, we will get uh, also problems uh, with unsatisfied people. So uh, we have to look to the taxation policy, we have to look to research, we have to look to uh, all the questions, uh, appreciation and whatever. How can we help uh, as SMEs to survive? And the truth is we have a lot of instruments where we can uh, help. Uh, and therefore, I'm very ha happy that uh, Herbert is with us. Uh, Herbert, we are very glad that uh, uh, agriculture will play, play as always uh, as a key role. And I think it's getting more important in the future as well uh, to get uh, our products uh, as efficient as possible to the markets, to look into the future, what kind of research do we need uh, to secure safety in, in uh, food and food distribution and how can we get the European higher standard in, in, in these areas? Because I think uh, Georgia also will tell us uh, that progress in these areas needed. So I'm now very happy to hear from you uh, what we can do together uh, to fight this crisis. Thank you very much, Paul, that you gave us now the, the overview, the state of art, what we are discussing. And now we're coming to the keynote to uh, Giorgio Ferraris. I think uh, you would start directly because you, your story is very strong. And I think, tell us how you started to prepare you for this crisis, when you started, and what was you experienced during this crisis with the measures you took. The floor is yours. All right, thank you, Horst. Good afternoon. Uh, perhaps I need to make a preamble um, that uh, uh, I think that out of this crisis will come out strongly companies that are serious about the safety of their employees. And that goes beyond being certified OSHAs, as of course we are, but having at heart the safety of your people. Um, at Fine Foods, uh, I'm legally responsible for the safety of our plants, uh, but uh, we have a team of so delegates for safety with uh, the head of human resources, the head of HSC. We meet every month to raise the bar of safety. And um, as a matter of fact, today, while I was browsing through, uh, through the files, uh, uh, Heinrich, uh, okay, can I share the, the screen? Yeah. Yes, it's coming. Uh, let me... Uh, okay. Share the screen. Because I came across an initiative we made at Fine Foods because at times uh, you cannot convince people about the risk. And um, so we decided at one point uh, that. I'm sorry, uh, I guess it's not really. Uh, all right. Well, yeah, I'll sorry, come back later not, to this. Yeah, sorry. Um, but basically, we made uh, uh, an initiative with, uh, that will seem to be ahead of times. We took uh, paintings, old paintings, like uh, the, the, uh, the Madonna with the Herman of Leonardo, and we, we changed it. We, we, we put a breathing mask on, on, on top of her, and we put it on a T-shirt, and we gave the T-shirt to our employees with uh, saying, uh, you're a masterpiece, you've got to take care of yourself. Um, when uh, this whole story started to unfold, uh, around was about around uh, mid-February, uh, our safety team uh, got together and said, uh, what about if this hit us? What should we do? And uh, so we started thinking of what would be the impact on our operations and what uh, we should do to protect our people. 
and by the time that we had the first uh, case, uh, we had already we, had, we issued in one day the safety procedures that um, eventually turned out to be the same that uh, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Health published in the, in the following days. That was basically if you have uh, if you start, if you sneeze or you cough, please stay home and wear gloves and wear a breathing mask, and keep the distance, and um, and. Uh, uh, the days were passing by, and uh, we constantly raised the bar of the safety. Uh, we, as, as an example, we made a shift shorter to give uh, the time for a company to sanitize the changing rooms and the dressing rooms, because of course the, the people can get infected in the dressing rooms. In, in a risk analysis, we discovered the, the critical areas in the plant were uh, dressing rooms, changing rooms, and uh, the canteen, where people get close to each other. And so we, we, uh, we started the initiatives to sanitize areas where there could be a contagion via the surface. Um, before uh, the use of uh, face masks were about uh, 70 percent and we said if you feel something please wear a mask even if not needed by your current operation and we raised it to 100. So the whole point was that uh, we, we could not prevent people from getting infected because people get infected in, private, in their private life but we could avoid that the infection could be passed on to some other employee. Um, it was very important because also we sanitize our plants. We, we shut down the plant for three days and we sanitize them with, uh, with um, sodium hypochlorite, with uh, hydrogen peroxide and hydroalcoholic solutions. And that was to reinforce uh, the concept that uh, uh, if you come to work, it's a safer place than going to a grocery store. Um, people liked it and um, uh, Giorgio sorry could I interrupt course. you right quick uh, now it's possible to share your screen you can do it yourself okay uh, let me see if I can so here we go so this was the initiative I was talking of uh, we made t-shirts and uh, um, see I'm sure you can see it but Basically, we made t-shirts with uh, a, the Madonna with the Hermin, with the breathing mask, and this uh, the Gabal Arena with, uh, with safety shoes. And, uh, and we share them, we gave them to all our employees. Um, so basically, uh, we, we worked very hard to uh, explain to our people that fine foods was a safe place to be. Um, we are at about 80% uh, uh, workforce. And uh, we are in a privileged situation. We do some competitive intelligence, and uh, even though we are we are privileged in a privileged environment, because uh, uh, as producers of pharmaceuticals and food supplements, uh, we are considered essential business, so we are allowed to continue. But uh, the amount of people coming to work is uh, amazing. Also because uh, most of the people who stay home are people who have uh, perhaps the beginning of a cold and now it's uh, the season of allergies, the season of colds, and we ask them to stay home. So it's not because they have, uh, they have some risk. Um, we have uh, no positive in, in our company. We have one case of someone who was already home so he didn't get it at Fine Foods and he was not coming to work. Unfortunately, five people lost their, uh, their parents and uh, several lost grandparents. And um, I spoke with each, with each of them, I mean, the one who lost the parents, and our stories that are really heartbreaking. Um, people were in the one that is in, was in 68 year old and uh, didn't have anything. And all of a sudden she went to the hospital and they never saw her again. Uh, I remember one that was a strong guy, 73 year old, a bull, they said the, the, the virus will never touch him because it's too strong and he didn't make it. And uh, despite that, people find the strength to come to work. And um, perhaps I should come to point two, because that is why Bergamo. Uh, Horst, if you agree, I would move to this other part because it is very intriguing. Yes, yes, you follow your own route. I think it's just the best. Okay, point. please stop me if uh, you have some no, question or if you want me to do something else. Um, why Bergamo? Because we don't have a big Chinatown. So, what, what, it's not a large town. I mean, the province of Bergamo is only 1.1 million people, and uh, it's curious. Um, there are a few things that are interesting about Bergamo. First, the Bergamasca are hard workers, very strong, and they go to work no matter what. And uh, if they have uh, a 38, 38.5 fever, 
you've got to shoot them to, for them to stay home. They go to work. And uh, I'm positive at that one point, someone who was sick uh, went around and spread it. The second thing is that uh, um, families are very close. They are very connected. It's a, it's a great population. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You should get to know them. There is a video about the Berger mask. It's in Italian. I, I wanted to, to do some captioning because we should circulate it. But uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, this video, as they say, everybody was in awe. It was ecstatic with the Chinese building a, a hospital in 10 days because they never saw the Berger mask. <laughs> and uh, um, so they called uh, 10 people, 15 people. They showed up 250. In the first few days, they put 10,000 uh, free hours, free for free, just to be in the hospital. So amazing workers. But something else is that they're very close as a community. They are close to older people. And uh, they typically live in a house with, uh, with a two-story house or um, so where, where the grandparents live on the on floor level and uh, the kids live on the upper floor with their grandchildren. And that is the perfect setup for the family. Unfortunately, it turned out to be very deadly for the coronavirus because, um, let me share another uh, slide of the London Business School that is interesting. So these old Italians are more connected to the young. So you see the orange bars, Italy, uh, green bar, Germany, but I believe it's the same for all the other countries in Europe. So these are the average daily contacts with those 70 plus by age group. So the contacts of Italians with older people are significantly more. So that means that older Italian people got more affected than uh, any other people, any other country. And that is the, I believe that is the other reason why we, we got so infected. But um, the, uh, the, the province population is reacting extremely well. People are very disciplined and uh, the measures were taken very seriously, not in all other parts of Italy, in Europe were taken so seriously. And um, I keep track daily of uh, the evolution of new cases. And uh, let me share another, another spreadsheet. Um, we can go on one sec. Here we go. These are the new cases of Lombardy. Lombardy is the region of uh, Milan, is about 10 million people, uh, the heart of uh, Italy, Italy's economy. And um, unfortunately, when, uh, there was something that was not uh, logical about this curve. And it's the fact that it starts in the city, then that city starts going down, there is another city that goes up, and then another city goes up. So there are factors that are offsetting each other. So um, I checked the moving average, but um, even that uh, not really helping. Well, when you go into the specific of a province that is a smaller cluster like Bergamo, I believe you have a better idea of the impact of the virus and the evolution of the, of the contagion. Look at this. This is what happened in Bergamo. And you see that uh, there is a constant up and down up and down and then going up and down and going up and down but the interesting thing is that if we see the moving average it's very good so i really i don't want to say to the close don't want to jinx it but we're getting getting out of it and uh, so that is why i'm uh, quite optimistic on the outlook um, i think is uh, an amazing story of uh, of uh, our company, what we are doing, we are producing, uh, we are receiving goods, we are shipping out, uh, we have good continuity for our customers, and uh, that's the important thing for, as a company. Uh, the important thing for our population is that they are reacting quite well. And uh, the path forward, the path forward, in my opinion, is that uh, we don't have to stop. I've, um, this is my second crisis because I lived 9-11, I lived in Manhattan on 9-11. So uh, it's the second time that I'm hit by a major crisis. Of course, that was different. But uh, still, I remember that at the time we went back to work immediately and uh, we were asked to, to, go, to, to go back to our regular business. I started flying again and uh, the situation at the airport was extremely tense. 
uh, everywhere there was a high level of tension, but uh, we, we business went back. And I believe that is what we need to do. So to go back to business as soon as possible with protections, that is very important. Companies need to understand that they have to protect their employees and do everything they can with procedures, safety measures, um, protections of devices for uh, individual protection, but they've got to go to, back to work. Because if this goes on too long, then we'll be hitting badly our population much more than coronavirus. Thank you very much. I have to say it's really touching how how you uh, describe uh, and tell us what's happening in Bergamo. I think there's a really a hum humanity dimension there. Uh, you cannot ex you cannot follow if you don't had the same experience like you. Well, what's happening there? I think this and that you show also that this is not about only technical acts and and economical acts. It's also how to work together how to take care about the employees and that there are families behind who are infecting also them that they are this is really also emotional i think really a, a tough thing a very tough thing one question before we go to the impulse statement i would have how you work together with the government how you what you heard about the european union what is this in this measures in this activities you did uh, can you tell us somehow about what, what you had for help or what for advice, information you got from the Italian government, from, from the European Union? What is there your experience, please? Um, uh, let me perhaps just go back to one thing that I forgot. I think that companies have a role in uh, uh, teaching their people and making them sensitive to the risk. And uh, I believe that uh, what we did well at Fine Foods had been to communicate well to all our people. We issued a number of procedures via our intranet and we asked all our supervisors to explain uh, the risk to everybody. And I believe we uh, served our population outside of the company in helping uh, people to understand the, the real risk because many comp perhaps we are uh, again I mentioned before we are privileged because we are also we are a pharmaceutical company food supplements and pharmaceuticals so we are more sensitive to the risk of uh, microbiological com uh, contamination and uh, and our people are perhaps more receptive but there is uh, an important role that companies have to play to to help their people to understand it um, very honestly, I don't want to say something that is uh, perhaps not uh, the, um, politically correct, but uh, we are, uh, as a company or as pharmaceutical companies, not like fine foods, we are a little ahead of the game because uh, we are uh, typically used to, do, to deal with this type of problems uh, on our daily life. So our reaction is much faster. And uh, typically, uh, the uh, measures that were taken by the Italian government that, in my opinion, were excellent, were... Uh, typically a week after or 10 days after what we did at Fine Foods. Same things, but a little later. And also in terms of uh, protection devices, uh, we typically keep um, a, like a stock of protective devices. So we didn't hit the crisis of not having them. We are a very conservative company, so we try to always to play it safe. And um, so also that was a reason why uh, we are in a, in a good shape. I can see that, of course, uh, a city cannot cope with uh, a, a crisis of this magnitude. You cannot have beds for intensive care to protect yourself for a situation like this. Otherwise, the, your cost would be through the roof. Um, as a company, perhaps you can do something to be in a safe position because what really counts is continuity. This discussion, thank you very much. I think in this discussion, we will go also how the, the also SMEs, but also companies, large companies have to prepare themselves for such crisis and where it make it sense and where it, it makes it, yeah, we saw it in the bank crisis in another way, how to, to build up reserves. And now it's a question how we can as entrepreneur prepare to, uh, to such crises. Now we're coming to the impulse statement, I think, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dorfman. Uh, it is not your main field, in, in, in fact, but I think here is really a political dimension inside, from our, uh, away from the technical side, what these entrepreneurs are going through with their stuff together. 
and uh, sometimes Brussels is sometimes far. You are an entrepreneur who is very strong also in his region. What you can say, answer to this or add to this, what the European Union is doing, how we can support this, these entrepreneurs, how we can learn from such lessons, we've, like Giorgio Ferrari has told us. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Horst. Um, and, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Hello, Paul. And, uh, buonasera, Giorgio. Grazie per quello che state facendo lì nella, in mezzo alla zona più difficile, dove è veramente difficile lavorare in questo, in questo momento. Y yes, I, I would like to say a few things about the general situation in the European Union and the politics here. Uh, but more on, on the on the food sector, which is my the food agriculture sector, which is uh, more let's see my let's say my field. Um, as you know, we have a big political debate whether the European Union is uh, sufficiently active in this crisis. And uh, um, on this, for sure, you can have a debate. I think the European Union took measures to uh, intervene. Maybe uh, we could do more, this is always possible, but on the other way around, um, I think um, we see also in this moment how important um, a stronger and more coordinated union would be, because uh, we are really, and it's very interesting what, for example, Reuters wrote in these hours, uh, we, uh, who uh, in a very nice article uh, showed uh, how early the European Union offered help also in the in the medical and, and sanitary sector already at the end of January, but the same prime ministers who are not able to take any decision now uh, refused every help at this time. And, and so it's it's too easy simply to blame the European Union without saying the whole the whole truth about the story. But I will come back to this at, at the end of, of, of my short intervention. Just some some thoughts about the food and the agriculture sector. Well, I think, first of all, um, also thanks to uh, people like Georgia and others, food supply fundamentally in this very difficult situation worked. Uh, we had uh, some empty supermarkets, but this was not due to, I think, not due to the food supply chain, but due more to people who uh, went to, as we say in, in German, Hamsterkäufe, who went to the shops and bought much more than they needed. But um, fundamentally, food, food availability and food supply worked. And I think this is an extremely important message in the European Union, that we are in a situation where also in a very deep crisis, food is available uh, and food is also safe and, and I think that the people also trust also in this moment trust in the high standards we have in Europe because I didn't hear any uh, debate about let's say implications in the spreading spreading the, the virus uh, implications of the food industry so the people trust in that food is safe that food is um, is not responsible for spreading this and the food industry is not responsible for spreading this this virus and i think this is this is a very important uh this is a very important uh, message and this means that the the, the the food industry and the agriculture fundamentally uh, did a very very important job in a moment where food maybe is more food maybe is more important than a lot of other goods because um, in the, in this moment what people need first of all is to eat and to drink um we saw how important uh, open borders and single market are in europe um because unfortunately the member states three weeks ago when the crisis really started in europe the first idea they had and was to oh, to close the borders and a lot of i said it also in some meetings in the last days if i see what's happening in these days a lot remembers me the, the situation we had in the in the migration crisis. Also in the migration crisis, some member states thought that uh, the first thing is to close the internal borders and the most helpful thing. And then we understood also in the migration crisis that internal borders will not block or will not stop migrants. And we have also to understand that internal borders will not stop this virus. Uh, it's ridiculous to think that uh, oh, by closing internal borders, we will stop uh, the virus. And this does not mean that you need to do 
um, sanitary checks when, wherever it's needed and wherever you can do it in order to avoid this virus for spreading. But this is for sure not, let's say, um, the most effective thing is for, lot, for sure not to, start to, to close the borders. And here, I think the European Union, at least on, on, on the transport of goods, was uh, very effective. I, I was not in my, in my home region, South Korea, in the last three weeks. I'm still in Brussels, but I follow clearly what's happening there. In the first two days, we had a 50 kilometer truck uh, queue uh, going to the Brenner. And the, uh, the work the European the Commission did. Uh, together with the member states, solve these problems at the border within uh, two or three days. We have still, we had some problems, and we still we have on 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 the borders for for the movement of of person of people. Um, this is for sure not the most important thing for tourism now because people do not travel for tourism purpose. But it gets more and more important for seasonal workers, and this is becomes a real problem for for the agriculture sector. We are going now into a period where uh, harvesting of some products start, especially uh, vegetables in the spring vegetables, and we need uh, we need the availability of of, of uh, seasonal workers. Uh, on this, three days ago, the Commission uh, sent it out um, um, a decision to the member states. It seems that it works, that the situation improves, but we need so-called green or blue lanes, whatever, so free uh, lanes for seasonal workers and for transporter workers. But also that this for the for the agriculture is, is extremely is extremely important. And then a fourth point, and my last point. Uh, one is we need at the European level um, a sufficient mechanism or working mechanism for crisis in the food sector. Uh, we have some in the common agriculture policy. I think we will see in the next uh, weeks if it's enough or not. Um, we will have some sectors, not all, but we have will have some sectors in agriculture which go into into crisis because clearly and this is good people go on to eat and to drink they need to, to eat and to drink and on some products they eat and drink even more i hear for example from my from my home region which is we produce a lot of apples we have a very good market in these moments but because people stay at home and maybe some sometimes during the day they move towards the fridge and take an apple um, other other products, which are and especially the products which are very much connected with the restaurants, bar and canteens, will go into into a problem. And this is uh, this uh, is the case for now some vegetables like asparagus, for example, which is very much connected to restaurants. It's a big problem for wine, uh, which is very much connected with tourism and and with with hotels with restaurants. Um, this is the case also for for products like beef, for example, Burger King and, and McDonald's. They are closed, and more and the half of the half more of the half of the beef produced and sold in in the European Union is minced meat. So go into burger fundamentally, and if the burgers are not sold because the the shops who sell burger first of all are closed, for sure the the, the beef sector, which is a very very sensitive sector in the European Union. Uh, because we have too much beef and the consumption is going down, uh, we will have a problem. And on these markets, I think we have to, uh, ha we need to have a good surveillance what's going on in the market. And if there is a weed problem, we need to intervene. And we will see if the mechanism we have today are enough. I fear that we need uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, we need to, to think in the new common agricultural policy how to improve our our um, our let's say crisis uh, management uh, uh, instruments. So at this about the agriculture. Let me say just two words about the general political situation. And going on a bit on what I said at the beginning, I think this is a very decisive moment for the European Union as a whole, because I'm coming from Italy, but uh, due to my 
let's say situation that I'm speaking German and following also the what's what's going on in in Austria and Germany. And I see a bit both, let's say, worlds, the Italian one and the southern Mediterranean one and the northern one in Europe. Um, I think that unfortunately, this crisis hits for now. We will see what happens in the, in the, in the next weeks and we hope for the best. But for now, this crisis hits the same regions which suffered uh, in the previous two crises, in the financial crisis and then in the migration crisis. And especially in, in Italy, we had a big problem in the financial crisis. We were where the, the member states most exposed in the migration crisis. And on both occasions, the Italians didn't feel so much of European solidarity. And now it's the third time in 10 years. And if the Italians do not feel a real, but a real, European solidarity in this moment, they will not trust in the European Union anymore. And I don't know if uh, George is agree with me, but unfortunately, I have to say, if there would be a, a, a referendum about about an Italian exit today, there would be at least a two-thirds majority. So we, we the, the only thing we we do not have, fortunately for now, is a political leadership which wants to do this. But this is, can be a question of time. We saw it after the migration crisis, what happened in the political scenario in Italy. Italy. This is the perfect moment for extremists to come in, into power and to create a situation in Italy which could be, and I don't want to be too dramatic, but I really believe this, which could be the end of the European Union. Because the Italy going out in the European Union is the end of the European Union. And the northern part of Europe must understand this. And in the debate we have in these days here, after the tremendous failure of the council meeting last week, and in brackets, if you do not agree, if the council does not agree about things, it's better they do not do a meeting. It's, it's the most stupid thing in this world to do a meeting, a council a summit, and not having a solution on the table. And I hope this does not happen again. So the next, on the next council meeting, there must be a solution, a real solution, where the Italians really feel solidarity and they feel that there's a really unusual instruments in unusual particular times. Otherwise, I fear that we cannot recover uh, the situation anymore. Um, I see it also in my in the personal context I have. The situation is very, very bad. The Italians do not trust anymore and I fear that the the, also the, the intervention or the, the, the interview this morning of the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, uh, where fundamentally she agreed with this position, uh, cannot solve the situation if there are not real facts. So we need facts. We need to explain the Italians that the European Union is there. We cannot explain them anymore that some member states which are they have the biggest advantage from the European Union to deny any solidarity. Um, otherwise, this crisis, uh, after when we come out, and I hope we will come out soon, that after this crisis will have a tremendous political consequence for the European Union, for the single market, and for the economy in Europe as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dorfman. I think I hope. We, we can have a more positive future, but I see the dangers, what you mentioned. I, I think this will be a huge discussion, also political in the North with Euro bonds, Corona bonds. And I think we, if we're coming from, from the food safety to this, I think it's such a general impact for every area. So if the internal market is, is broken away, so uh, we have also to think, rethink food safety in Europe. But uh, now is the time for question and answers. Please raise your hands, uh, ask your question, and say your name and your organization. Paul, perhaps you're opening this and, yeah. Yes, I just have a short question to Giorgio. You know, I think for us in SME uh, Europe, the most important thing is which advice can we give to our companies and to our entrepreneurs? Do you have a list which, uh, uh, which types of uh, uh, precaution you took in, in your company 
and uh, how the advisory people in your company had to communicate this. This would be quite uh, important because then uh, uh, SME Europe could distribute uh, to all our members and I think that could be very helpful. Otto, please. Sure, I'll, uh, well, I'll be happy to share what we, what we did. No problem with that, sure. Uh, the, um, of course, comp depends on the size of the company. I think that uh, the most critical uh, environment is a medium small sized company because you have typically one person that decides for everybody and the flow of communication is relatively limited. So because uh, the information goes up and down, up and down, it doesn't go across. Uh, so that is where in the crisis, so I mean that situation would be even efficient and you can have even uh, excellent financials because you limit your cost, your structure cost to the very minimum. Unfortunately, um, you're not well equipped to weather storm like this. We are, uh, as an example, every day uh, we have a meeting with my first line of management on Teams. We are uh, 16 people. We are all constantly aligned with everything that is going on with the company. And um, so I think that that is, uh, number one is to decide what to do rapidly. Number two, to communicate efficiently. And uh, perhaps number three, uh, to be convinced that is the right thing to do. Because uh, if eventually you know that something is the right thing, but you're not that motivated to do it, uh, uh, that is where. Uh, so mm, a strategy without a good implementation is a hallucination, someone said to me. So, <laughs> do, do your people uh, 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 take masks all the day in the company? And do they change the clothes when they go in and out? Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, there are um, there are steps and procedures for what to do in every moment you are inside the company. And yeah. can we have a list of these practical things? Sure, absolutely. Could you no prepare problem. for us? I think that would be the most helpful thing. It'd be very helpful. You know, for the one uh, entrepreneur who has uh, five or twenty employees, he should know. Uh, how to act properly and how to give a feeling, like you said, to uh, the employees. Uh, in, within our company, we are safe. If you go home, be careful. Huh? Yeah. That would be the best message. Right. I think there is also a sort of, um, it must be a little paranoid. I'm sorry to say this, but at times when there is a crisis, you, uh, God is in the detail. You've got to make sure that uh, you think of everything. And that is where a group of people can do better than one person. No one in the Olympics that did the 400 meters did better than four times 100, never in the world. So <laughs> that is the point. And uh, uh, thinking of uh, the virus can be passed by documents. Think of it. How many times you pass a piece of paper inside the company? And uh, perhaps someone wouldn't, know, know them, wouldn't even think of it. But if you are infected and you pass a document to someone else, that is a good way to spread it. So you got to wear gloves. Uh, just to tell you something that is trivial, apparently trivial. Thank you very much. Now we have also two more questions. Henrik, Claudia Schmidt. And yes, um, uh, Mr. Schmidt, would, do you mind if I put you on speaker? Okay. I will uh, give it now the possibility to speak. Thank you. Please state who you are so everybody knows. She's muted still. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute her, but... Oh, well, in that case, I can also read her question right quick. Okay, so I will read the question of Mrs. Schmidt. Uh, Mrs. Schmidt is a former MEP uh, from Austria. Uh, so, the European single market has to work to guarantee the food supply and the supply of protective clothing, for example, in Europe. What are your ideas, uh, ideas to convince the member states to keep their borders open? And in what way do you try to deal with the fear of the people that food from Italy or Spain could be contaminated? Um, yeah, who wants uh, to take this question? I have to say one story on it to this. In Lidl, all the pasta from Italy was keeping there and all the other pastas were really bite out. But the Italian products were staying in the supermarket. It's very really strange what, what you can see sometimes. Uh, well, uh, it's education of people. 
There is no evidence that the coronavirus would survive on inanimate surfaces for more than a few hours. So by no means um, goods could be contaminated that, that stay in a warehouse and then get shipped. So there is really no risk. And that is the science that I'm not a virologist, but it's the science that says that. I think that we would not stop this simply by um, closing the borders, but by educating people how not to infect other people. That is, I'm personally convinced. I said, I'm back to my point that we have to go back to work. I'm not saying to, to be suicidal. We have got to do it in, a, in the right way. So um, explaining people how they, they have to behave, how they have to wear protections, and uh, it's doable. We are doing it and uh, keeping, of course, as always, fingers crossed. Uh, we don't have any positive in the biggest concentration. We are above 7,000 per million in this region. That is, consider that, uh, I'm not sure if you see the average, uh, Spain now that is the first in Europe is about 2,000 and uh, average of Italy is uh, 1,700 or 1,800. In the province of Bergamo, we are close to 8,000 per million. So we are four times the highest concentration in Europe. But despite that, if you do things right, um, that is how you control it. Okay, thank you. We have a second question, uh, Henrik. Yeah, uh, so the question is from uh, Mr. Pio Zega Els. He is attorney for uh, MEP Lucas Mandel. And his question goes to Mr. Dorfman. Um, Okay. In times of the current pandemic, what does solidarity towards Italy mean? How does it look like? Corona question marks? Mr. Dorfman, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think uh, what it means is is that there need uh, there's a need for 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 uh, economic financial solidarity and. Uh, you can call this as you want. I think it's better if you know, do not call it Corona bonds because the word Corona bonds is, bonds is already a word which we cannot use anymore. But it, it, I think it does not depend on the fact how we call it. Uh, the fact is that uh, the most affected member states uh, like Italy and Spain, they will have huge costs uh, to, uh, in the crisis and they will have huge cost after the crisis because the economy will not recover from one day to the next. And I completely fully agree with what uh, Giorgio Ferrari said before. We need to look now how to come back to produce and how to bring people again into work, but we will have high costs. And this hits a member state like Italy, which already has very, very high uh, public debt. Um, and in this, in this moment, um, we do not need, I think Italy does not need somebody who pays the Italian debt or who gives, uh, as, as a, let's say, as, as a nice gift money to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Italy. But we need to put in secure the Italian um, economy and the Italian debt. So we need to avoid that uh, this situation brings or, or, or creates a, a considerable increased spread between uh, the, 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 the public debt in the, in the better member states and in Italy, because this would be a, a situation which brings Italy in the same situation like Greece some years ago. And this we need to avoid, I think, in the interest of all, not only in the interest of Italy, it's, it's, um, in, the, in the interest of the whole of the whole um, uh, eurozone. So fundamentally, what does it mean? There's, there's a need for a fund of, of billions, probably hundreds of billions, uh, with, a, with a European guarantee, um, and which the, the most affected member states can use in order to, uh, let's say, to, to, to have an availability of public money at a very low interest rate. So now the last question round. I think who wants to ask? One thing I would like to ask, uh, Giorgio, what do you think what we can learn after the crisis for, for your, the food safety? Is this also a time for reforms? Can we do something better in the future? Should we change something? Should something be more higher standards? Something should be easier? There must be better controls, better support. What are you thinking, what you can learn now out of this for food safety? Um, 
Well, first, I don't believe that there is an issue on food safety in this case. And that's important to say because there is a confusion between the um, contagion of coronavirus and food safety. There is no risk on food safety. Um, I believe, uh, I, I want always to see the, the, the glass half full. And uh, I believe we'll be fortunate because uh, if uh, these uh, disease were deadlier, like in Ebola, we would not be talking of the same thing now. And uh, what we can learn is that uh, uh, our society is a tend not to believe. I believe that when it started in China, uh, people said, oh, well, in China, they are eating bats and dogs, so perhaps they have poor hygiene standard. Not true, because in the Hubei and Wuhan province, they are an extremely advanced province. And when it came to Italy, I think there is always this stereotype of pizza and mandolin and uh, that we are uh, sloppy. Not true, because this region is uh, very advanced in terms of uh, health system, but it hit it. And uh, people disregard it. And I was shocked when I saw the, the game in, uh, in Liverpool. Uh, I was shocked seeing the spring break in Florida and, uh, or the Mardi Gras in uh, Louisiana, in New Orleans. Uh, that means that uh, people didn't take this serious. I think that what we, this will do is uh, to create consciousness that uh, a virus could be destroying everything that we built after World War II very rapidly. Thank you. Last question. No, no one new one. Then we, yeah, Chico, Alexandro, please. Thank you, Horst, and uh, thank you, uh, Herr Rubiker, for giving us the platform here to discuss this. And a uh, big thank you, of course, to Herr Dorfmann and uh, Domagoy for having the perspective of um, European Parliament or a member state that uh, holds the council at the moment. Yeah? We, as uh, Herbalife, uh, we are part of the Healthy Nutrition Working Group and of SME Connect um, because we work in that space and uh, we sell our products, uh, our nutrition products through a network of independent distributors. And uh, for these entrepreneurs as well for our suppliers, it's a great platform to add their voice. And uh, I can just say we can consider ourselves lucky to have such a prudent player as Fine Foods as our manufacturing partner, who helps to bring, uh, keep our products on the market and also helps our distributors uh, to keep making money. That's, uh, that's crucial in this moment uh, where everything is pretty dire. So thank you for that. And a special thank you to you, George, also, for being an advisor to our working group, I feel honored by uh, your by your support. I just have a question for um, you, your company belongs to the essential industries uh, that continues to bring nutrition uh, to the market uh, in the time of lockdown um, and uh, limiting accessibility to healthy foods. Uh, that's really crucial. And uh, I mean, from all the elements that you have to juggle to make sure that the supplies keep on coming, um, where do you th see the, the biggest threat, and what could uh, the colleagues, uh, the political decision makers uh, do to mitigate that risk that one of those elements uh, is affected? Um, well, at this point, honestly, I believe that we are, I don't want to talk it too soon, but I believe we are, uh, I wouldn't say over the hump, but at least we reach a plateau. So um, I would not consider a serious risk. I mean, the risk is more uh, psychological of a final consumer that um, are afraid of buying pasta or are, will not be allowed to go out. That is more uh, a social impact than industrial. From industrial standpoint, we are um, perhaps in a better position because we never stopped. Uh, we're still running at uh, almost full speed. Uh, other industries, industries will start later, but um, I don't see a big issue in continuity, for sure, in the food supply chain. And uh, I don't see, we, we monitor constantly our suppliers and we have no evidence of uh, interruption of uh, interruption of supply. So I'm pretty confident. Good, thank you then. We're coming nearly to the end of the webinar. Coming now to the conclusion. Domagoy, it's, it's your part to summarize the points, what we learned today, what you learned also outside from the box because you're not from the food sector, but I think pressure is also hidden in the, on this virus and uh, what you can learn from this Italian experience. Because it's yours. Because we depend on tourism. So hello, hello to everybody. Thank you, Horst, for the invitation and, and to make the conclusions. 
uh, thanks to all the participants. Uh, I, I think we have, uh, we are confronted with the, the, the two simultaneous crises. One is the health and the second is economic. And I'll try just briefly to, go, to, to do this, this conclusion, what, what all the speakers have said, uh, but allow me an introduction. I mean, I hope that we, by now, we all understand that it's not a flu. There are still some people thinking there it's kind of a flu, but for the old people, it's not a flu. And my original basic uh, education is I'm a medical doctor. So I, I remember a, a little bit of, of, of virology, and this is the, the virus that we are confronted all for the first time as a human race, with no vaccines, with no medications. So uh, there is a serious issue. And as Giorgio very well said on the, this health and on the other hand, business issue, I, I, I will go through what he has said. So personal awareness, number one, of all the employees, everybody, of course. Then second is for the company's sanitization of the facilities. And last but not least, there is a, a issue of balancing the family ties and social social distance because all of us in the in the south i, I think of europe have a, a similar similar uh, habits on the on the economic side uh, i think we we understand that people may be stopped for the time being to visit everybody but the the goods must not be stopped because this is what eventually helps all of us surviving uh, through and after the crisis and then really enabling the companies to move on. Um, once again, we have seen that the, the business leaders were faster than the political leaders. Uh, I hope the political leaders may be uh, in the future faster and learning something from this crisis, particularly EU level. Uh, yes, I mean, future of EU has been already in discussion now, it's going to be even more, but um, what I expect personally and what we, we heard from some of you is that the, obviously the crisis will show the, the weaknesses, the countries, the union as a whole, but I think also it represents the opportunities or at least it shows there is a lot of opportunities if working together. But as, as I think Giorgio or, or Herbert actually said, it's, it, it, solidarity cannot be only towards Euro. If Euro is the only glue or the tool of the solidarity, I think it's not enough for the people and for sure not in, in political, uh, it may be in the business, but not in political, in political world. And uh, Paul have very well said on this agri, agri thing that um, there needs to be a discussion on, on public procurement versus the procedures versus the production and uh, the consumer protection and quality control, which obviously is in Europe on the top level, but we also need, obviously, to think what are our possibilities as the union or the agriculture in general, uh, potential production and, and, and all different levels. And last but not least, if you allow me, um, there is a third, a third, this is a personal touch for the end, if you allow me, Horst. The third crisis that we rarely hear is the crisis of actually of the internet and the news and the news that are shared. Um, on one hand, we have all seen people uh, supporting each other, sharing information, cheering up, which is great. But at the same time, or even more, we have uh, seen the, the fake news and, and all the disadvantages of the fake news spreading with no responsibility of some of the sources of this, of this fake news. So I, I think that we could really learn a lot all together. Um, I hope that we are going to, to see the, the ending of the, at least the health and the, the, the coronavirus crisis very soon. We hope uh, all before the summer. I hope that we can also see soon some of the medi real medication because the vaccine is not going to, to, to be there for another month. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that eventually that uh, we have learned in this kind of crisis that if we work closer together, not only national, but also European Union level, that we might be much more resistant to, to any further, any future uh, crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much for the conclusion. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to George Ferraz, who took his, uh, his time and give us such a, a picture from, from, from the situation. And I think we learned a lot. First, it's about humans. Huh? 
to train your stuff. This is the main thing. Food is safe. And uh, we're coming out of crisis if we start now, if everybody keeps to stays to the rules. And then I think we can have, a, we are fast out of the lockdown and we need reforms like Tomogoy says now and Mr. Uh, Herbert that we say now it's the time for reforms that the European Union survives. So thank you, Paul Rubik, for hosting this event. Thank you for Alexandro for co-hosting and Henrik Reimer. See you next time. We have now a numbers of webinars. In the morning we had the webinar together with SM Europe, with Commissioner Tom Brombrowski. And now, uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, thank you. I did. <laughs> and on Monday we have again about the European uh, crisis again, a webinar and we will have with Commissioner Hogan uh, a webinar about uh, global trade. So keep in touch with us come on our websites or register you to our email distributor. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Giorgio. It was really very great that you have. It was my today. pleasure, my honor and my privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Ciao, Bye. ciao, all the best. Bye. Bye. Bye.